Hi, welcome to Urban Renal Talk with Tamika. And Steve, hello everyone, hello. Welcome, welcome. Yes, we're back um, with a new name and I added host. Will we bring him in momentarily? Urban Renal Talk with Tamika. And Steve, hello everyone, hello. Hi Jermaine. Hello, hello, yes, yes, Hey, Jermaine, Jermaine Fingers. A new, a new co-host here from Indiana. Yes. What part of Indiana are you from, Jermaine? Um, Evansville, Evansville, Indiana, the southern tip. Great. great. Okay. So, what's going on, Tamika? We're going to get back with you in a second, uh, Jermaine. Uh, That's what's cool. going on, Tamika? Yes, well, Steve and I revamped the show Um to change the name and call it Urban Renal Talk. Urban Renal Talk is, uh, sorry, is talk about the urban community, what's going on in the urban community with kidney disease. Now, when we say urban, it's not a black thing or a white thing. Urban is a cluster of where people live at, where a lot of people live in one area. They, it's, that's usually called the urban, sorry, the urban community. And that's where we focus on with kidney disease is those areas that's highly affected with kidney disease. And if you look and see, most areas that's affected with kidney disease are the urban communities. Absolutely, absolutely. Also, what we wanted to share with uh, our audience is that we also had to change the name. Uh, when we were using Kidney Talk, we were unaware that someone else had this uh, trademark on the podcast. So, uh, you know, eventually we had to revamp and change the name and uh, get rid of all our uh, videos and shows that contain Kidney Talk with Tamika and Steve. In light of that, Urban Reno Talk, Reno is just another name for kidneys or the ur urinary system. So when we say renal, we're still talking about kidneys, so don't get it confused. And we had the, pretty much the same platform, but what we like to do here is focus on awareness, prevention, and education. That, that is our main focus of the two leading causes of kidney disease, which is diabetes and hypertension. In addition, we also like to use this platform to give patients who are suffering with kidney disease or have transplant and who has excelled uh, as a patient to come on our show and share their story to give hope, uh, strength to someone else who may be newly diagnosed with this disease, mm -hmm. Tamika. Yes. Yes. Also, yeah. we are here to spread awareness, prevention, in education so hopefully our stories or the people that we bring on will help change someone's life even if just a phone call to tell someone hey you may need to go to the doctors because there's someone out there with symptoms just like you and um i think you may need to go get checked because your kidneys may be failing you never know how your story can affect someone else That's so if you have a story Inbox us, and we'll gladly put you on the show. Where can they inbox us at, Tamika? They can inbox us at Urban Reno. Sorry, Urban Reno. Sorry, Urban Reno Talk on Facebook, the Facebook page. Okay. Or they can go to UrbanKidneyAlliance.com and email us. Well, actually, it's dot org. Dot org. I'm sorry, and email us. <laughs> yeah. so, this is live and perfect. <laughs> <laughs> right. Absolutely. Um, yes. Also, you can go to info at urbankidneyalliance.org, um, you know, submit your story as well if you want to be on the show. And as Tamika said, uh, Urban Reno Talk messenger page. Uh, Tamika, tell us, yes. um, before we get to you, Jermaine, and we'll be there in a second. Yes. We're going to uh, talk about ourselves. Tell us what you do, Tamika. 
I am a dialysis, sorry, I am a dialysis technician. I've been working in dialysis for this year is my 19th year working in dialysis. Um, not only am I a technician, uh, my son was diagnosed at the age of 18 months with nephrotic syndrome. After he was diagnosed with nephrotic syndrome, um, he was put on dialysis and that's where my job became very personal. It was no longer just a paycheck for me. It became a way of life, a way of learning how, how to prevent these diseases and how to educate my patients about kidney disease because I wasn't educated. Even though I worked as a technician, it just was a job. So I really had no knowledge of kidney disease. I had knowledge of receiving my paycheck. Wow. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. It, so it, it's like it doesn't affect you until it affects you. And that's what happened. It, it, it affected me to where though going to work was different like when my son got sick and i had to sit and watch him or watch them put the catheter in him life just was different like it just when i went to work i didn't walk in there the same i actually cared about my job wow wow so as for myself um i'm a registered nurse i've been doing dialysis for about 33 years coming up in November. I started in 1985 in Austin, Texas as a dialysis technician. Um, I traveled across the United States doing dialysis, different facilities through the, uh, through the South and out West. Um, and also I hold two master's degrees, uh, one in uh, master's nursing and leadership and management and the other in uh health education and promotion and also hold a uh, post certificate master certificate in uh nonprofit management so, awesome yeah so we you know we're we're really serious about what we're doing it ain't about titles but what we experience is that you know we're not on here just talking we want to let you know our credentials and we're not just saying stuff just to be saying it uh, a lot of this is evidence-based education material that we have research done extensive research so without 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 do let's introduce jermaine uh jermaine okay. uh, go ahead and tell us about yourself jermaine fingers okay hello i guess well you know i'm actually uh uh, dialysis patient. I have uh, in stage renal. Um, I, prior to that, I was a CNA for uh, twelve years, so I, I got that. Uh, I'm still got that nursing thing going, but yeah, I'm an actual uh, uh, dialysis patient, and um, I am waiting to get a transplant. So things have progressed for me with that, and I got real serious about um, uh, ESRD here recently. Uh, Cause I didn't, I didn't agree with a lot of things my doctor was saying, so I started doing extensive research myself, and that's how I found you guys actually uh, through a mutual friend of uh, Steve and myself. So that's how I became where I'm at. So I'm one of the patients to actually advocate for myself and for others in my uh, in my community uh, to help them out, and I also preach awareness as well. Jermaine, aren't you also a football coach? I am also a football coach. That is correct. I, I, I try to uh, I, I blend that in also. I got a game this weekend. <laughs> okay. How are the games? Yeah, so um, down in Evansville, what's going on down there as far as the, uh, the, the kidney community and, and dialysis and hypertension and diabetes well as far as the dialysis arena goes um uh, i know we've talked me and, me and my me and you me and you steve about how all these dialysis uh centers keep popping up so down here in evansville the community is not real big but we got um one two we actually had three centers open up within the last six months so that sort of tells you how um, ES, ESRDs are kind of, you know, affecting this area in, in the Midwest, in this little community I'm in. Um, we're in a tri-state, 
So in various areas, you know, they opened up those centers and it's just getting rapid. Um, there's a lot um, of the diabetes is getting real bad down here as well. And um, uh, a few a few uh, people have just passed away uh, because of that. I just attended a funeral. Uh, two hey, weeks ago. Let me, I'm sorry to interrupt. When you say yeah. bad, describe when you say bad. Describe that when you say bad. I mean, can you put that vividly? Uh, bad is it is 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 getting rampant down. It's like it's like an epidemic, in my opinion. Um, of the diabetes is just going crazy. You know, people sugar high. Actually, one of my coaches, he couldn't coach the game two weeks ago because his sugar was out of control. <laughs> And he was telling me, well, you know, I take my metformin, you know, and, and, and I do everything the doctor says. I don't know why my sugar's high. He's like on a roller coaster. One minute, he was up to three 340. Next minute, he's crashing. I'm like, dang, coach, what, what's wrong? You know, you got um, – I make sure he has everything he needs on the field, you know, candy, water, whatever, you know, but he, he just couldn't go. And, and he had to actually have a procedure done on his eyes. Because the sugar is kind of out of control, and I don't know why. You know, what so is he yeah. eating? what is he eating? That's that's what you got to look at. He's not actually. He's following the diet to the T right now. Um, he's not eating a lot of stuff with the sugar in it. You know, he's he's watching everything he eats. Uh, real like real careful. So I'm I'm not sure. I'm not actually sure why his sugar is going like that. And I kind of, kind of in a way, you know, that kind of happened to me at one point when I was on, uh, when I was, because I was a diabetic first, and that's what kind of got my kidney going. So uh, it just happens like that, I guess. I'm not sure why the body does that, and he's trying to do everything right. It, it, it has to be a reason because I know a gentleman that's on dialysis that reversed uh-huh. his, his diabetes, you know, and. I mean, it has it has to be something, a link missing, you know, even the medication or. I was I was told, Steve, and uh, I got this from a doctor. I was told that the metformin is might be causing him that to be the way he is. Um, I think I, I spoke to you guys. I had to confirm with the, uh, another doctor friend of mine. Actually, he's like, man, your your friend shouldn't be on that metformin. It's, it's, it's messing him up. And he, and he seems to think that his metformin is causing him to have all these troubles. Actually, I, it caused me, from my own personal experience, and I can't speak for everybody, the metformin caused me to act crazy, too. And I took myself off of it, or I told the doctor that I was allergic to it, and I think I am. Mm-hmm. But they actually put me on insulin. So I was a type 2 diabetic on insulin, and it did me better than actually the metformin because the metformin was screwing me all up. Wow. So I don't know if it's, if it's medicines or not. You know, he, he's dumbfounded. His wife is kind of dumbfounded about the situation. Um, is he exercising? He's a coach, so he, he exercises every day. He walks every day. He walks uh, two miles every day, and then he has to. He has everything with him, just in case he crashes. So, I don't know why his body's doing that to him because it just happened all of a sudden. Like last year, he was fine. It just happened within the last two months of him just going. Uh, his body just being out of whack. What's his weight? Well, uh. Mm, See, I weigh 190, so he weighs a little bit more than me. So he's got to be about 215. Well, for one, metformin causes your blood sugar to drop. <laughs> um, and it also causes physical weakness. So if you look at the side effects from metformin, mm-hmm. he has a lot of the side effects, and they really should ha- have taken him off. Also, it messes with your B12. So your B12 is your energy. Yes, so yes. Give him the metformin, they really should have told him to take um, vitamins, but a lot of doctors 
don't want you to take vitamins because if you take vitamins, you may start feeling a little better and no longer need them. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. So, yes, he has three of the side effects of metformin. Yes, and I so and his, I, doc- his diabetes all the time that, you know, he coach, you got to watch it. You end up like me. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And then, or taking metformin, and they shouldn't. Metformin, if you have diabetes and they're giving you metformin, like, they're also dropping your sugar. You know, that's the first thing they give you is metformin. Because when yeah, I got because diagnosed in 2001, yeah, that the first thing I got diagnosed in 01, that was the first thing the doctors gave me was metformin or glucophage. Same deal. Always wow. ask about the side effects of the medicine. And ask what's the, what's the alternative? Right. You see, no. lot, that's where the education comes in because a lot of folks don't understand or know there's an alternative medicine out there maybe for them. You know, it's, they just pretty much, you know, doctor writes the script down, you take it to the mm-hmm. pharmacy, that's it. They don't ask any questions. You know, because there's a doctor, and a lot of folks just go by the doctor's word. Right, and you also have to re- remember that medical reps go to doctor's office and sell medicine to them, too. Right. Yeah. It's all big money, yeah. Greg. It's big money. Yes. So, so Tamika, um, you know, I had did a post yesterday and it said that there's an influx of uh, newly diagnosed patients that are being admitted to dialysis. Mm-hmm. And especially in my unit. And this is going on, if it's going on in Baltimore, it's going on all across urban America. Yes, because yes, we just got two new patients uh, Monday, and the new girl, she got sick. First day on dialysis, she got sick. So, you know, in light of that, Tamika, that's why, you know, this tour the um, kidney disease uh, urban America silent killer tour is uh, necessary because if it's happening in Baltimore and if it's happening in Evansville, uh, Indiana, if it's happening in Philly, it's happening in Richmond, it's happening, I'm sure, little towns in North Carolina, little towns in South Carolina, Columbia, it's happening in Atlanta, Richmond, I, I mean... I read an article that there was like three extra units built recently in Corpus Christi, Texas. Corpus Christi, Texas is very small, but it's an urban yes, community you. there. Yes. And they have three units, three dialysis units. That so, and no one is asking why. It, exactly. And so, what that's telling me is that they know. Something is coming down. Something is, I mean, it's already coming because you see the newly diagnosed people with, you know, diabetes mm-hmm. and hypertension, which is all the mm-hmm. two leading causes of kidney failure. And so yep. that's why education is the key, not money. This is, this is my opinion. Money mm-hmm. is not going to do it because if money was going to cure kidney disease, it's already been it would have already happened. Millions of dollars has been spent on these corporate corporations putting out for the kidney walk, um, research, articles, but yet more clinics are being built. And that 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 equation doesn't look right. And my right. thing to, to enter that equation is education and prevention because once someone knows especially if they're at risk, once they know they're at risk and then they get that test done and find out if they're in any stage at all, because you can have kidney disease at at, at stage one and never progress to stage five, especially if you, you know, your GFR is 90%. Right. So. But um, see, see, that comes with education. Like, if they're not, that's what I'm saying. 
Yeah, uh, they're not going to know. And that's why this tour is really important because this tour will be educating along with raising awareness and showing ways to prevent it, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, if you're out there and you're listening, please share this. Um, if you know a pastor or a church or event coordinator that would like to host a tour, um, please, you know, call us, inbox us, yeah. message us on our page. This is very important. Now, the reason how this tour got started is in Baltimore on May 29th, there was a distribution of 360,000 FEMA boxes. And that was distributed from a rec center into a West Baltimore community that contained items such as this, the uh, Spam Potted Meat, other items that are major contributors to diabetes and hypertension. So if they can do that in Baltimore and we don't hear about it, they can do it in Philly, they can do it in Indiana, they can do it in all the cities that we're touring, Tamika. Yes, there are. Nonprofits can get access to food. They can get the food. You know, they're actually asking nonprofits to sign up for the food so they can deliver it because they need to get rid of it. So half of it's already all uh, just about expired. So not only are they receiving bad food, but they're receiving um, food that's not good for them, food that's high in sodium, food that's pet, uh, sorry, food that's processed, like no one should be eating potted meat. Do you even know what potted meat is? Oh, like, absolutely. Absolutely. They shouldn't be eating it. You know, they should send some seeds and stuff like that so they can start growing gardens and stuff like that. Like, there's another way to do it. Absolutely. Like, potato absolutely. chips is not going to save a life. Like, come on. Why are you <laughs> going to treat a more illness? But even you can have bushels of fruit that are non-perishable, like pears, you know, apples, um, what else out there? You know, other fruits like oranges and lemons and all that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't get it. In one county here in Baltimore, out in the county, they have food boxes as well, and theirs contain small crackers of, of milk, cereal, uh, fruit, you know, I mean, stuff that is healthy that's on that food pyramid chart and a stark contrast to what they gave out in Baltimore City. But you know what, Steve? As I'm thinking about it, I remember as a little girl and I lived in North Philadelphia and on the corner of my block, there was, um, they call it surplus. So actually the same things that they had in that box is similar to the box. We got meat. I remember my mom having potted meat. We got the block of the USDA beef that comes in a can and a couple more items. So actually they've been delivering illness to us for a very long time because a lot of times that's all we had to eat. Wow. Jermaine, how about yes. Evansville? As far as uh, distributing the food? As far as the um the food pantries go right do y'all have a lot of um uh, or corner stores or supermarkets what's the ratio uh we got um in in the um in the uh, in the uh, in the black community there's um there's two and uh one store is like a penny store for the kids you know they got junk food or whatever uh, there's uh there's another store and they actually have fresh food and fresh meat. Actually, they mm -hmm. uh, they get uh, fresh fruit, um, meat, um, uh, the juices, the natural juices and stuff. You know, they still sell the candy and, and the stuff for the kids, but they actually get good stuff. They're a little high, but they actually have their own meat department, so they don't depend on um, on those uh, on the government. But there are. The food pantries around here and the churches pretty much kind of donate to them a lot. So if you go to a uh, the food pantry, from my experience here, they they have a lot of oranges, apples, uh, pears, uh, bread, wow. um, 
Uh, there's really there, it's hardly they actually don't sell they actually don't give away the meat. Uh, they'll give you mm-hmm. the protein uh, in in a vegetable form. Um, okay. Uh, like like peanuts or something like that. Uh, they don't actually give away the meat. They just give like the the wheat bread, uh, the apples, the oranges, and the fruit. Um, they're pretty good about that here, but I can't say that for maybe the big cities in Indy now. I think that's me. Give the protein and the and the nuts and stuff like that. I think that's yeah, not the good yeah. way to do it. Yeah, and then they give you, you now they give you the canned vegetables and then they give you the canned goods like the baked beans, but they make sure that it's not expired. Everything is 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 within date. And mm-hmm. if it's not within the date, they throw it away. Awesome. So, so they actually they're pretty, Yeah, they're pretty good about that here. Now I can't say anywhere else. Um because you know the, the 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 actually it's the Catholic churches that have the food pantries here. Uh same thing to DePaul and all those good areas like that. They have uh and they, the food bank. They here in Baltimore as well. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. So they, they actually make sure they have everything is fresh. Now, I haven't seen anything that's been out of date because uh, I actually went and saw it myself. So it's pretty good. Why do you think kidney disease is so common? I think kidney disease is common because of, of, of the way we were, most of us was brought up on the food we ate. You know, um, okay. we, you know, growing up and stuff, you know, kids, you know, kids nowadays, in my opinion, of course, we, we grew up, you know, we always had the, uh, the little juices, you know, the cheap candy. Now, ladies used to get for a nickel, you know, we used to stuff all their in us, you know, growing up. And another thing, the fast food, McDonald's, in my opinion, is the number one killer. Uh-huh. It's my own opinion. So, guests out there watching, um, if you have an opinion on this topic, drop it below and we'll read it. We'll post it and we'll read it. Why do you think kidney disease is so common? Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure someone out there knows someone that's in a stage uh, of kidney disease because nine out of ten people have stage three kidney disease, which is which is moderately reduced kidney function and not even aware of it. And if you're not aware that you have stage three kidney disease, more than likely you won't know that you have stage five and you continue to do the behavior that you're doing to accelerate the disease uh, sooner than later. So if you don't know, you can't attack it and manage it to halt the progression. Right. Right. That's what's important. And that's why, people need to purchase those GFR cars that's coming out because yeah. that would definitely yes. know your numbers. Yes. Know, yeah, know, your, know your numbers. Because when I got diagnosed, I was in stage three. When I when I got diagnosed, I was already in stage three. So. And what happened? Tell us about that, Jermaine. Well, um, I got an accident and uh, that's how I found out. I got an accident and they were they were doing the blood test on me, and the doctor came back. He's like, you know, your kidneys are what do they call it. Um, they're irritated. That's what he told me. Your kidneys are irritated. So I'm like, so what's that mean? He's like, well, you're still peeing and everything. And I was like, well, yeah, I noticed the bubbles in in um, in the toilet when I when I urinate. He's like, what do you mean? So I said, you know, it looks like dish soap. And so that was my body spilling the protein. There was a telltale sign that I was in trouble. So the doctor's like, yeah, we'll, we'll give you a test, you know, and it came back and then he told me I need to see a urologist and a nephrologist. And then when I seen the nephrologist, he diagnosed me with stage three. So that all happened within, uh, we'll say three weeks uh, of my, uh, of my car accident. So I, I knew something was wrong because, you know, my urine and everything, but, I didn't know. I, I didn't know I was in trouble with the kidneys. Let me you ask know. you, Jermaine, uh-huh. was, was you already a diabetic? Yes, I was. Mm-hmm. Yes, I was. I was already a diabetic at the time, and I was just really getting a handle on my sugar. 
at the time. I mean, I just really was getting the hang hang of it. I switched up the foreman and went to the insulin, and I was getting everything together as far as that goes. I got in the accident, and that's what happened. Yeah, and it was probably slowly, like, you know, damaging your kidneys, and you wasn't even aware of it. Exactly. That's another because nobody thinks about you know tear your kidneys up. They always say you can lose a leg or arm or you can lose your eyesight. So yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Henderson, she says her brother is sorry. Her, her brother, seventy six years old, he was diagnosed with kidney disease related to the medicine he was taking for gout. I need my glasses. Yeah. So he was diagnosed ten years ago. Yeah, I can well, believe I that. Depending on the medication, um, that's the thing. You, you take medication for one problem, and it can have an effect on something else. Yeah. And we're just realizing that now, you know, all these years people have been taking medication, not, not aware that they probably were damaging their kidneys in the process. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, we have... Like with uh, Karen says about her brother, and not only that medication, there's plenty of other medications that affect the kidneys from antibiotics <coughs> to um, to uh, say again, uh, you like the ibuprofen? Ibuprofen, yeah, yeah, but yeah. So, we have another on um, watcher or viewers, uh. Kathy Kennedy Cam Camilla, I'm sorry if I pronounced it wrong. She says that hers was caused by weight loss surgery. Wow, that's new. I never heard that before. Did they nip something well, and didn't the say for the medicine? Uh, I'm wondering. I mean, we don't know her case, but yeah. I mean, that's kind of rare. I mean, that's not the norm. Because again, statistics tell us hypertension and diabetes are the leading causes, the leading causes mm -hmm. of kidney failure. So yeah. you have you you have other other causes, but we as as a um, organization we try to attack the uh, preventable diseases. That, I mean, because we we don't have any. Um, uh, we don't have any control over the genetic uh, causes of kidney disease. Right. So, and there's a study with that going on as we speak. Yeah, but we, you do have control over if you have hypertension or diabetes type 2. I do know for a fact that you do have control over that if you're mindful of what you're doing and you're taking your medicine, you're exercising, you're reducing your sodium intake, you're watching, you know, your diet and you're managing it, it can definitely be a win-win a situation that prevents you from going down the road to dialysis. Yes. Right. Um, I would say to Kathy on this matter, ask more questions. When you see your doctor, just ask more questions. Um, and then maybe you could get really down to the root of it. Absolutely. Yeah, you gotta have you gotta ask questions. Because if you All don't the time, I there's an awesome for being so interactive with us today. Times, because most people don't know that there are stages and yeah, renal disease. I'm sorry. Um, so could you describe to them um the signs? I'm sorry. Say that again, because you kind of came. Could in you, out. I'm sorry. The stages, like the stages for the GFR and stage renal disease. Yeah. So. You have stage one, and I should know it by heart. Mm -hmm. I don't have a, the scale with me, but if you look at the GFR scale, stage one, and don't quote me on this, folks, but stage one is, I believe, 
uh, equal or greater than uh, 90%. And then once you get down to stage two, which is 89 to, I want to say 69. Uh-huh. Or, or no, I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry. Eighty nine to sixty. Stage two, and then stage three, kidney disease is fifty nine to thirty, and then stage four is from twenty nine to fifteen. And then stage five is less than 15%. And then once you get to stage five, it's basically a done deal. I mean, you're going to go on dialysis. However, there's many people I've seen in in some of these um, groups that have waited until lower than 15% to start dialysis and manage and there has been people like Jermaine and others that I have talked to recently that um, the doctor approached them at stage three and was talking about placing the access in. So, yes, uh, education there, I think, is uh, it's a disparity in that because you have people who are real mindful and, and and what they're you know doing with their disease and managing it, even down to stage four. I mean, they're holding off like a year, maybe a year and a half before they even get to stage five because they're doing, you know doing all the right things, opposed to someone who may be in an urban community, don't have access um, to information, and they're they fall into that trap of the physician, you know, encouraging them to uh, go on dialysis sooner than later. And even I ran into patients who say they still urinate a lot. I mean, a lot. And and we're not taking fluid off. We're setting them for the minimum, like 500. (laughs) So it it, it makes, it kind of makes you think, could this person have waited? you know, for a period of time. You know what I'm saying, well, Tamika? Yeah, but even with that, well, first, I'm going to step back just a little bit. Karen wanted to know where you talk about percentage of kidney function. Yes, those are the percentages of kidney function. Um, so each stage has a different function um, percentage of how well your kidney is functioning. Actually, you can go to the doctor and get a test. The test is really simple. Um, but back to what you're saying. Blood test. I'm sorry. No, yes. the urine and the blood test. Mm-hmm. Yep. They'll do it. Um, they probably ask why or whatever. Just be a little uh, aggressive because you want to know what your kidney function or where your kidney function is. So, Jose, do you think you started too early? J- who, Jermaine? I think he might have froze up. Yeah, he froze up. Um, even with the, they're still not removing fluid. I had a patient, she was like, you know, I'm still going to the bathroom. And I'm like, I understand that. But your body is still not excreting the toxins. Like you could go to the bathroom for years and your body is still not excreting toxins. Yeah. You're just one of the lucky ones to still urinate that don't put on a lot of fluid, but you still have toxins in your body that's not being excreted. But, you know, on the flip side of that, I heard that when, and this is just hearsay, I haven't did any research on this, but I've heard patients say they, when they started dialysis, they were urinating a lot. And then Mm -hmm. as they went on, they stopped urinating and they Mm -hmm. think the machine may have had a cause to that. So I don't know the correlation if maybe the kidneys just finally stopped working at that point or if if the machine accelerated the condition yes you know what steve they could actually be right because remember sometimes when people get transplants we put them on a machine to jump 
jumpstart that or jumpstart that kidney. Just imagine what it's doing to a kidney that's barely working. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, I, I I agree that that is a reason why. Kathy, she says she's waiting until she has to go. Kathy, do you have the access already? So if you're going to wait till you have to go on, my advice to you is get your fistula or your graft now. Like, don't wait. Just go for the surgery now. And also get on a transplant list. Um, what stage it'll be is better than Stage five. Oh, I think she says stage five. No, no, no. Oh, she says, I am stage five. She's stage five. So what are they waiting for? She may not be displaying those symptoms. Right. Wow. We'll definitely keep you in our prayers, Kathy. Yes. But yeah, get on the transplant list ASAP and see about getting the access place. This way, you don't have to have that catheter sticking out of your chest. Right. Okay. Also, she in the um, back. Kathy, please uh, visit our website, Urban Kidney Alliance for. Uh, kidney disease information, uh, yes. you know, for patients on dialysis. You can go through that site. Uh, we post often. We haven't posted lately because we've been focusing on this uh, tour that we're trying to uh, come through cities to spread this awareness. And also, what I didn't mention, Tamika, is that, you know, we're connecting biblical principles oh. And with this uh, awareness campaign for kidney disease, because the Bible do talks about healthy eating and living. So I also wanted right. to share that with the audience. Right. Hey, Tamika, tell, yes. tell us what's coming up with our, with our guests. Okay, our so our, our future yeah. guest, we, we have a celebrity guest next week. His name is Chef Chevron. The week after that, we have a good friend mentor, uh, in the kidney world. Her name is uh, Lynette, Lynette, sorry, Lynette Luckers. She's with the Mary. I'm really excited for that one. Um, she's been advocating for kidney disease for many years since her mother passed away. Wow. Um, I have, yeah. I've been waiting for this one. On Instagram. Yes. Yes. He says, says that I eat healthy and I walk. Okay, hold up. We have a question on here, Steve. She okay. says, uh, Karen, Karen Henderson says, speaking of access, my brother arms and chest looks like he was in a knife fight in the street. Oh my goodness. So he has some access issues. That happens, unfortunately. Um, especially his age, too. And we don't know if he has um, diabetes, which affects the uh, arteries and the veins, or if he has any type of uh, cardiac disease or arterial disease that might be, um, you know, interfering or messing with his arteries. You want to show my arm? That sticks. Huh? <laughs> I said, or if he has some really bad sticks. Yeah, like me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Show your arm, Jermaine. Sure. I don't think he's there. Yeah, yeah he is here. Oh, okay. I can't see him on my phone, but um, he's still frozen. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, he's, he's here. Yes. I see him on the computer. Small <laughs> veins. No diabetes and no cardiac. So that's the issue right there. He has small veins, and nine times out of ten, they collapse. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He, might, yeah. he might have issues like I will. So right now, he has a catheter right now, Karen. So I see Jermaine showing his access. Yes. Yes. That's, that's messed up. See, I, I wonder, <laughs> Jermaine. Ask Jermaine, does he let, uh, are they stick in the same spot each time? J Jermaine, are you being cannulated in the same um, spot? Or are they rotating? They're rotating now. Back then oh. they didn't because I didn't understand. 
Okay, well, so I'm let me explain it if people out there don't know what I'm talking about. So cannulation of the access is cannulating either the fistula or cannulating the graft. What Jermaine has right there is a graft. That's a that's artificial Gore-Tex graft inserted under his skin because he had some vein issues. And when I mean cannulation in the same spot, there's a, a there's a pseudo aneurysm right there. Those two bumps are from being cannulated in the same spot. Absolutely. And his arm shouldn't look like that. But because they keep going in the same spot, that spot is getting bigger and bigger and actually is getting weaker. So if someone was to stick in there, he'll bleed a long time. Exactly. And they don't stick on that side anymore, period. Yeah. Yeah. That... Right. So a person arm is supposed to look like track marks, like dots going up the access versus holes in their arm because you're allowing the skin to heal. Absolutely. Right. It's supposed to be two finger widths apart. Yes. Yes. And for people that's on the office, they should know, but wow. I tell you, you got to tell them. Jermaine, how many hours yeah. you run? I run 3.30. Okay. I run three and a half hours. I use, uh, yeah. I run 3.30 and I <laughs> use uh, 14. Ask I mean, him how many hours he run. Three and a half hours. He runs three and a half hours. Okay. And what is your blood pump speed now? It's down to 400. Okay. So let me educate you guys. So when I ask the blood pump speed and dialysis, the dialysis machine has a blood pump on it. And that's what circulates the blood through the dialyzer. So tomorrow morning, I'll go live from this page to show you guys what the blood pump speed is in the dialyzer because I do have to work early in the morning. So Steve, I'm going to do that. Um, to show what the blood pump looks like. So the blood pump goes around and it goes really, really fast or it goes really, really slow. And the slower the blood pump speed, the better the patient's heart will be. Um, also with the weight that they put on. But stay tuned because we'll talk more about this to get you abreast to how dialysis works. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. I even got the needles right here that, to show right quick if you if you want to see it. What Patients get cannulated with. Hold tight. So, Kathy, I have to be to work at four o'clock in the morning, um, but it's still going to be on. So you could check anywhere after four o'clock in the morning. I don't want anyone to wake up crazy like I do at two forty five just to watch me go live. <laughs> how dialysis works. Um, just an empty machine. No one's on it. So this is this is the needle that is used for dialysis. Right. And Steve, what gauge is that? This is a 15 gauge sharp one inch needle that's used. Does that needle? Yes. Does that needle go into the arterial or to the venous? Because I see it has a hole in it. Uh, well, both of them have a hole in it. So now mm -hmm. um, it can go in either one. It get, But okay. on this, a lot of these have like color coded. So okay. Uh, yeah. Eventually, you're going to use this to cannulate the arterial. Yeah, red, the red arterial and blue uh, is the blue. And then yes. you the other one that uh, has the blue clamp for the venous site. And again, right. this is uh, one inch. That's a sharp needle. Mm -hmm. Okay. 15 gauge. So, you know... Jermaine, you are definitely a warrior. You are, you're definitely a warrior, brother. And, you know, keep doing what you're doing. No, I am. I, I've actually I've actually changed my needle size so, um, since I got with you guys. Um, yes. Do we uh, have um, anything lined up as far as tours in Philly? Well, I'm working with Enon Tabernacle. Um, I'm waiting to hear back from their secretary to see what days we could get in October. Because like I said before, October, September, October, uh, there's a kidney walk in Philadelphia. So Philadelphia will be, will be Philadelphia will be 
we're going to be very kidney friendly here. Oh, great. So that's why um, I'm focusing in September and October for the different churches here in Philadelphia because of the. Right. As Jermaine, um, as he reached out to any of the uh, faith based community in Indiana, Evansville. Jermaine, yes, have you yes, I have. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes, I reached out to. I reached out and, here, and I reached out to Champaign, right, Illinois. There, um, listening. If you want this urban, uh, silent urban care. Wait a minute. If you want this awareness tour to come through your uh, church community, please reach out to us because this message is is really critical that we pass on. Okay, it's really yeah. critical. There's not going to be any shortage of dialysis clinics, mm -hmm. but there's going to be an increase of uh, patients coming soon. And, dialysis. and even if you have a community center, we'll even do a community center. Our goal is to raise awareness, also raise, edu sorry, educate, and also prevention. Like there's so many people that's going to be on dialysis. Dialysis is about to be a way of life. And if we can save one life from hitting that machine, you know, our duty has been done. So if you know anyone that have a community center that we can have free of charge, um, it will be awesome just to be able to spread awareness and let people know what's really going on in the urban community. Absolutely. Absolutely. Jermaine, does he have any? Ask Jermaine, he got any, uh, what about the bionic kidney? Oh yeah, that's that's yeah. coming out too. The bionic kidney. You said something about bionic kidney. Yes, that's I've heard uh, the research is starting. Uh, it's starting to pick up a little bit more now. Yeah. So Kathy wants to know about the bionic kidney. Uh, the bio. You want to step? One I don't know too much about. Have you read up on that? Maybe the artificial kidney. I think doing some so research it, it, on it. It's the same thing. It's the same not thing. FDA, it's thing. not FDA approved. No, and they're trying it on animals first, but they are asking for some people that want to try it to try. I know uh, with anything foreign, your body's going to reject it. But you know what? They're doing that in Barbados. It's not. It's not being done in the United States. Yes, it is. Uh -huh. So, so it's, it's done. Yeah, it's done at the university. There's going to be a lot of situation complications with that. Uh, not only that, it, it may not reject it because you know how you got pacemakers and stents and other mm -hmm. items in your um inside your body. You're going to have to have some type of blood thinner. I mean, not everyone mm -hmm. is going to be compatible to that. You're right. You got to think about infection. I mean, it's so much mm -hmm. you got to think about with that. Um, and I, I don't think that's going to stop the dialysis industry from doing hemodialysis. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't, you I know. think it has to do with insurance, too. Like, not every insurance is going to... I don't think Medicaid is going to cover that. You know, a it, private insurance will cover it. Medicaid's not going to cover that. Uh, yes, let me give you a little background uh, to me and Steve on the bio and the kidney. I, I've done so, a little research on it. Um, well, what's up with Jermaine? I, I can't hear him. I can see oh. him talking. <laughs> okay, so he was about to give us a little background on it. You just cut him off. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. All right. It's all right. Uh, the bio and the kidney, I've done, I've done about a year and about a year research on it. It's, uh, they are doing the United States um, University of San Francisco. And uh, Vanderbilt University right now, um, they, they're, they're getting ready to do human trials. Um, it has stopped for a moment, but it's about to pick up. And the only thing about it is that, um, it runs off your heart rate and your blood pressure. So your, your, your pressures need to stay high, and that's what they're working on right now. The, to, to figure out what uh, the pressure can stay high so the device can actually work because it's working off your heart. So your heart has to be strong if, in, in order to it to work for the technology. If your heart is weak, then then it won't work and it start clotting up. That's what they found out so far. So they're trying to work. 
the kink out of the uh, of the the bile and kidney, uh, so that um, you gotta figure out you gotta have a strong heart. So they're trying to work those kinks out right now. Uh, they actually just changed uh, a key part of their research team. Uh, one of the ladies actually left that was on it, so she's being replaced by somebody else. So that's another reason why right now it's on hold. So they're trying. The goal for the bowel and kidney is to uh, start human trials in 2020. That's mm. the you know uh, for the bowel and kidney. Like I said, it's coming out of the University of San Francisco. In Vanderbilt University, but San Francisco um, is the actual um, college that's doing the, the major research on it. So, and okay. uh, if you can, you can actually contact them directly and try to be on their list to be one of the human trial people. They have you just go there. Uh, you can put Bind and Kidney or Time and Kidney in Google, and it'll pop up the University of San Francisco, and they have a link on there. I show you who all the people that's on the team that's involved. You can actually email them mm-hmm. directly and try to be on that list for the tw- excuse me, for the 2020 trial. So, so they're they're working on it. They're also working on something else called the uh, uh, the mini kidney. If anybody's heard about that, uh, they're working mm-hmm. with the uh, with the cell to grow a mini kidney. And actually, it has been successful in animals. So they're trying to get that approved for humans um, as a as a transplant option. I believe they're going to use your cells in the future to help grow that. So the anti rejection meds won't be, I guess, as prevalent. So, but like you said, I don't know um, with the insurance. I'm quite sure if it gets FDA approved for both. Mm-hmm. Medicare, Medicare probably will eventually cover that because you know mm-hmm. in, in politics, um, Donald Trump did approve uh, here recently uh, that you can start to use the experimental uh, methods to try to heal yourself. So that just came out here recently. So mm-hmm. if you got the money or you got the insurance that will cover that experiment, go for it. Okay. So I have a question about that, Jermaine. So do you think this is a better option for someone who has hypertension, someone who has high blood pressure? Or if, they- if, if that kidney can regulate it, then it'd be, it'd be a good option. Because, you know, sometimes your kidney failure can cause you to have high blood pressure and not the other way around. So it can it can go both ways. Um just like if you get a transplant from a human person, like I got high blood personnel, so I'm not sure if my high blood pressure will drop when I get me a new kidney. I'm praying it, praying it does, because you know I think you know I'm running. I, I have a thing called anxiety at the center, so when I go to the I run in the high uh, 180 when I get there, almost 200. But when I'm at home, I run in the 130s. So my my other doctor, my my MD, not my nephrologist, my MD said that I have some kind of anxiety issue, and it just pops up the dialysis. So I'm not sure, but to answer your question, it might help out a person that has high blood pressure if they get uh, an artificial kidney. If it's if your kidney failure is causing the high blood pressure, on the other way around, I don't know. You might still need your pills. Okay. I was just wondering because the heart has to pump at a certain rate to receive the bionic kidney, you know, will be better. Oh, for- yeah, that, yeah, your pressures have to be uh, a certain level. And and I and I ha- try to get some clarification. Do you, does that mean do you have to have high blood pressure or what? All, all I was told is that your pressure in your all of your pressures need to be high. And if you have low pressure, or I guess if you're one of those, because you know when you're dialysis for a while, your pressure gets low. Mm-hmm. Hypotensive, yes. You get yeah, you get you get that, and um, so I'm not sure if somebody like that can actually qualify for that type of kidney. I think you still have to be halfway normal or or running high to even get one of of the bionic variety from from wow. my 
didn't never. So I, I'm trying to get some clarification on that now. But from my understanding, you have to stay high to even get it because it's got to run. Right, right. I'm going to do some research on it, too. I'm curious. I just want to know how does it work and what are the side effects on that heart? Like if the heart has to pump at a certain speed and the clotting factor, just like what what are the people in for when they go for the bionic kidney? Right. That, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's going to have to be a workup, just like yeah. the transplant workup. Right. I'm sure it's going to have to be some type of workup to where, you you know, you had to do a stress test to mm-hmm. see if the heart can take it, like you said, to see what yeah, the, uh, it's still the same ejection, rate, ejection fraction rate is that the heart right. is pumping. And, you know, if it pumps, you know, lower than a certain percentage, you know, a patient it probably disqualifies that person from receiving that uh, right. artificial mm-hmm. uh, or that bionic kidney. Yeah, because right. not not everybody can get that so kidney. It's, it's going to be, you know, a big criteria probably to get that once it it hit the market. So <laughs> I, I think it's the way they promote it that may get people kind of, wow. you know, their um, hopes up high, and right. they may not even be eligible for it. Yes, I think it does give people hope because everyone, even with transplants, they just want to get off the dialysis. Not well, realize well. transplant is a treatment, is not a cure. Absolutely. You know, um, this right here, yeah. the bionic kidney, is a treatment. It's not a cure. Not a cure. It's not a cure. Yeah. You know, and they don't put that out there. So the minute people hear about a way to get off of dialysis. They want to just go for the first thing they hear without doing proper research. And it's still a treatment is not a cure. Yeah, and, I, and when I first yeah, found that, I, you it know, broke I my heart. I my unit uh, two days ago, uh, and I saw someone there that I knew, and they had a transplant, and they were back on dialysis after 18 years. See? 18 years. Mm-hmm. And they, they were dealing with um, kidney stones as well. Yeah. And they think that the procedure that they have for it may have did some damage to the kidneys. Ooh. So if you have a transplant, wow. you also got to watch out what type of medical procedures or tests that you have because that can put you mm-hmm. in as well as losing that kidney. Mm. Right. But see, they don't tell them this. They don't, I don't think the education of transplant is the way it should be to let people know this is not a cure. This is a treatment. These things can happen. This is what you need to do to prevent this well to power because you can't say what's going to happen or what's not going to happen, but you can help them prevent it. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Right. Right. Prevention, you know, going to the doctors, if you see these signs and stuff like that, you know, make a phone call, go to the emergency room, don't take this, don't eat this, and also change the way you eat. You can't get a kidney and still eating the same way you were eating before. Like, you have to change your lifestyle. You really do. Because the food out here is bad. It's not good. Like, it's not good. Yeah, because, you know, you know what they tell me, to be honest. I agree. Absolutely. I got, I got a trans... Now, I might be... Transplant here soon. I know you had to get up in the morning. I think winding down. Yes, yeah. Yes, I do. I had to get up at two forty-five. Why do you have to get up so early? Because um, with me being pregnant and just going back to work from my surgery, I'm not as quick as I used to be. So I give myself that extra, the extra thirty minutes to just make sure everything is put in the computer. I'm not missing anything. My baths are put out because I don't expect anyone to hold my hand on this process. So I just do it for me so my day will go well. Okay. What time do y'all start? We started, actually, we started at 4.45. But text don't come in until 4.30. So I try to get there between 4 o'clock and 4.10 to get everything out for my whole entire day. And, And what time does the whole shift end? Well, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, they end at 8 o'clock, mm-hmm. but I'm not working till 8 o'clock. I'm sorry. Some days are over right now. 4.30 to 8 o'clock? 
Yeah, I'm serious. I used to do that shit. That was a killer. I mean, we do. We start at five thirty. You know, the text and the nurse have to be there five thirty, and the last patient comes off at like seven fifteen. That's Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Yeah, so this shift is Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday group is we close at three. So that's good. Those are days I prefer to work, but I'm going to take what I can get. Listen. <laughs> right, right, right. So, but yeah. Five, two. So I'm up and uh, park uh, my stuff. Okay. Yeah. So I can't wait till uh, next week. Yes, I can't wait till next week, guys. I can't wait for the next seven weeks. Um, I've been really working hard to get guests um guests that can help us raise awareness and make a difference because we do this we don't get paid to do this uh we actually pay to host this on this site on be be live the kind of we want to save lives you know the youth will be affected with kidney disease 2030, 2035, there's going to be a surge. Even before then, there's going to be a surge of youth. These babies, my grandson, you know, my son's age, my daughter's age is going to be affected with kidney disease and everything comes from what they're putting in their bodies. Mm -hmm. From the Percocets, well, my son doesn't do Percocets, <laughs> um, but from the Percocets, the Zannies, the poppy stores, the bodegas, the Chinese mm -hmm. stores, the fake food, the food that you're buying at Dollar General and at Family Dollar and at the dollar store, all that stuff is breeding illness into our community. So if you can help us, if you could donate, if you could find a church or, or share this video, uh, watch us every week um, as we keep raising awareness for kidney disease, we will really, really appreciate. Keep commenting, keep engaging. You know, this topic is not just near and dear to my heart, it's near and dear to Steve's heart. It's Jermaine's life. Yep. And there's so many people living this life that will surprise you. And the more we have these conversations, the more people are coming out and discussing their life on dialysis. So until next time, I'm Tamika. This is Steve. Hey, Jermaine. We got Jermaine and this here. Urban Reno Talk. And we'll see you guys next week. God bless and have a wonderful night, guys. See y'all.